love has won, death has lost. Hallelujah for the souls he bought. Hallelujah for the cross. And when I breathe my final breath, I'll have no need to fear that rest. This hope will guide me into death. Hallelujah for the cross. Hallelujah for the war he fought. Love has won, death has lost. Hallelujah for the souls he fought. Hallelujah for the cross. For the war he fought, love has won, death has lost. Hallelujah for the souls he fought, hallelujah for the cross. Hallelujah for the cross, hallelujah for the cross. I spent in vanity and pride Caring not my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me he died On Calvary By God's word at last my sin I learned then I trembled at the law I'd spurn Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary There your mercy and your grace was free There your pardon multiplied to me there my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given Jesus everything. Now I gladly know Him as my King. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. There your mercy and your grace was free. There your pardon multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty. Calvary There your mercy and your grace was free There your pardon multiplied to me There my burden so found liberty At Calvary The love that drew salvation's plan Oh, the grace that brought it down to man Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span At Calvary There your mercy and 
your grace was free there your pardon multiplied to me there my burden so found liberty at calvary there your mercy and your grace was free there your pardon multiplied to me there my burden so found liberty at calvary there my burden so found liberty at calvary Calvary. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Good morning, church. That was good. Let's do it again. Good morning, amigos. Good morning. Welcome to Northern Ireland Baptist Church. This is our second um, weekend when we have a live service, and it's great to have all of you guys here in the house of the Lord, let's go and pray for Josh and Melinda Kuransky. Uh, they need prayer. A real Christian church is the one who will pray for the missionaries all over the world. Amen? Amen? Let's go to the Lord. Father God, thank you for this wonderful day. We worship you, and we pray for the family of the Kuranskis working here in America, raising a new church, a place where lots of souls could be saved uh, by your grace. And Father God, as we worship you, uh, be glorified. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Along with praying for the missionaries, uh, a portion of what you give for your offering actually goes to support missionaries like the Taranskis. Um, so I just want to encourage you to continue to be faithful to give. We thank you for your faithfulness so far. Uh, Daniel reminded us last week of what Christ said, that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So continue to be faithful to give. We have a variety of ways uh, that we can give. Uh, we have boxes located around. You can give online. Uh, I find that to be a whole lot more convenient. That's what we do. Uh, so check that out. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and just thank him primarily for what he's already given to us. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you. Lord, long before we, we give anything to you, you have given everything for us. Christ is, is far greater than anything we could possibly give, Lord. I, I, I'm reminded of Romans 8, uh, 32. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Since you've given us Christ, how could you possibly withhold anything else? And because we've received Christ, how could we possibly withhold anything from you? And so, Lord, as we give our tithes and offerings in a variety of ways, Lord, I pray that you would use it for the glory of Christ, that Christ may be elevated. Lord, that your, your mission that you are accomplishing through this church would continue on. But ultimately, we, we pray that your spirit would move, that people would be saved as a result of the work that takes place here. That Christ would be lifted high. That he would receive the honor and glory that he deserves. And Lord, as we move into a time where we worship you through, through singing, worship you through hearing your word preached, I pray that you would move. Open our hearts, open our minds, eliminate distractions. Lord, eliminate distractions in my heart and my mind that I might focus on Christ. Lord, may we be all the more made more like Jesus. Help us to love him. Help us to enjoy him. Help us to obey. And God, be glorified, I pray. And it's in your son's beautiful name. Amen. Would you all stand and sing with us again?
Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Hold him may be seated. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Paul, Zuri, for your leadership this morning. If you believe that, would you bow with me as we pray and thank God for the grace that we have through His Son. God, you're such a good father. You're such an amazing dad. You've given us the spirit. You've adopted us as your children. And by your Holy Spirit, we can cry out, Abba, Father. Father, we, we confess to you uh, our inability our neediness, our dependence upon You. God, we've seen in the last now eight or ten weeks that it just takes one little, one little virus to bring the whole world to a standstill. 
God, we've, we've got technology, we've got scientists and doctors and PhDs and experts, but at the end of the day, one little virus has reminded us how contingent and dependent we are upon someone greater than ourselves. And God, I pray that in your church, uh, of all the places where we could be reminded, God, that your church would be reminded of your nearness and of your goodness and of our dependency upon you and our desperation for you. God, thank you that you've given us life in your son and that if we are in Christ, you don't see us in our sin, you see us as your son, God, and we thank you and we praise you for the blood of Jesus. It's why we can worship in spirit and in truth. And so, Lord, as we as we dive back into Hebrews this morning, I pray, God, that you would open our minds and our hearts to see the beautiful things in your word. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we dive into Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 26, I want to say just a couple of things about um, where we are uh, on the journey back to worship. Uh, Part of the answer to that is, I don't know, (laughs) but we are thinking about what phase two might look like and beginning to think about having some children's offerings again, like nursery and preschool and children's worship and how those things might function. Uh, Certainly, we're still waiting to hear from our government on the specifics of what that can look like, and we will conduct ourselves in a way that is in accordance with uh, the regulations, that whatever they be. But uh, we are thinking about a phase two, which would be uh, allowing our our kids to to have child care of some kind. And so uh, more details will be coming on that as we're able to solidify that. I just wanted you to know we don't want to be in this holding pattern forever. And so we're, we're trying to work our way back to uh, normal. We just don't know what that timeline looks like, but it does look like the next step will be the reintroduction of, of child care during the worship uh, time. And so stay tuned for that. We'll obviously, like we did for phase one, we'll, we'll publish a plan. We'll make you aware of it as soon as we know what it's going to look like. And the second thing I wanted to say is um, this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. And so uh, Jesus says in John 15, 13, he's talking about disciples, right? He's talking about life in the church, that we should love one another. um, And we should love ultimately like Christ was going to love. He's in his earthly ministry and he says, predicting what he's going to do, right? Greater love has no one than this, than that one lay down his life for his friends. And so on Memorial Day, uh, while that verse is ultimately about the sacrifice of Jesus to redeem his people, uh, we certainly are right to recognize soldiers who have left, men and women who've left the comfort of home, left the freedoms that they know here uh, to serve in uh, lands far away, and to uh, many of them pay the ultimate price. That's what we recognize on Memorial Day, men and women who who paid the price of their life in defense of our freedom. And while um, we are living in unusual days in our country, we still have the freedom to gather and to assemble and to worship. And we give God praise for that, and we ought not forget that it came at at a great price. It came at the price of a lot of human blood that was spilled uh, and continues to be. Uh, I was reading the statistics this, this weekend. We've lost nearly 100 uh, men and women in Afghanistan uh, just this year. And, you know, um, our government is, is trying to make plans for withdrawal from, from Afghanistan. And as often happens, when you begin to plan to withdraw, um, the enemy intensifies. And so we're continuing to lose life uh, around the world even today. And so um, I want to say we just need to be mindful of that. Um, that that freedom isn't free, and it comes at a great price. Now, having said that, I want to ask you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 26, and we'll continue through verse 31. Uh, As you're turning there, I want to remind you, this is not an easy text. There are three warning passages in the book of Hebrews. This is the second warning passage, and it's a tough text to preach, but it is the Word of God. And so, It's important that we hear it and that we understand it and that we interpret it rightly, and I've endeavored to do that this morning. In a recent article dated October 27th, 2019, in the Christian Post called Leaving Christianity, What Are the Statistical Trends? 
It was estimated that between 26 and 42 million people raised in Christian homes will leave the faith by 2050. Now, if we were to take that statistic and we were to say, well, you know, that's, that's a bit high. If we cut it in half, it's still a tragedy. If we cut it all the way down by 75%, it's still a tragedy. This statistic, if it's remotely true, and it's based on trend lines that are current in our culture right now, they didn't just make up a number and throw it on the wall. They're, they're extrapolating from the rate at which people are abandoning the faith, and if that rate of growth continues, this is what will happen by 2050 in our country. And this statistic, if it proves to be true, is alarming because the Bible tells us that those who are truly saved by God will truly endure in the faith. We are not saved by a one-time profession or a one-time prayer, but by being forever united with the person of Jesus Christ. Christ, the living Lord Jesus Christ, a dynamic, ongoing faith. What does the Bible say about people, however, who seem to have been genuine believers at one time, but who ultimately walk away from Jesus? Hear now the Word of God. Beginning in verse 26 of chapter 10. For if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said... Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This morning, I want you to see three things. Remember the context. The church is being tempted to abandon faith in Jesus. To leave and to walk away from the Gospel because it's becoming harder to follow Him. They're beginning to face persecution. And so, given that context, when we are tempted to reject Jesus as the basis of our hope, there's three things we see. First, we must consider the judgment that awaits God's enemies in verses 26 and 27. Second, we must understand that God is right to judge those who reject His Son. And finally, we must rest in the saving hands of the living God. First, we must consider the judgment that awaits God's enemies. These people to whom the author of Hebrews is writing are asking this question, look, what if we just set Jesus aside for a while? What if we don't continue in Him? All those things that you were talking about two weeks ago when we covered Hebrews chapter 10, 19-25, they're asking, what if we don't draw near to the Father through the blood of His Son? What if we don't gather and assemble regularly? What if we just kind of set Jesus on the side and kind of do our own little God thing? What if we hear about Jesus and even seem to believe in Jesus and then we set Him aside permanently? What is at stake when we don't keep believing Jesus because faith in Jesus is inconvenient. Look at the word in verse 26, willfully. It's important that we understand what particular type of sin is being described. The author of Hebrews is referring to a deliberate and intentional, a calculated rejection of faith in Jesus, a rejection of the Gospel. He's not saying that those who trust in Jesus will be sinless. He is rather saying, speaking of a particular sin, the ongoing and stubborn refusal of faith in Christ. Schreiner says this, Sinning willfully does not refer to any and every sin committed. He has in mind apostasy, the rejection of the Christian faith. So what is at stake for those who get near to the things of God, even seem to trust in Jesus, but walk away. The author says everything's at stake. Eternity hangs in the balance. For those who reject their need for Jesus, do you see it in verse 26? After receiving the knowledge of the truth, 
there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. What does this mean? It means if you throw away Jesus, you throw away the only sacrifice that saves. You can't run back to the Old Testament and sacrifice a lamb or a bull or a goat and be saved. Those things don't save. They pointed you to your need for a Savior who could really cleanse the conscience and really make you clean before the Father. So if you throw away Jesus, you throw away forgiveness. Forgiveness is either found in the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus, or forgiveness is forever forfeited. Schreiner says this, Forgiveness only belongs to those who continue to trust in Jesus for forgiveness. Now what makes this passage challenging to preach and challenging to interpret is that it uses language that suggests that people knew Christ and later didn't know Christ. That they were saved and now somehow they aren't saved. The words receiving the knowledge of the truth are associated in Paul's writings with true conversion, real salvation. In 1 Timothy 2.4, he says, God desires all men to be saved and to, here it is, come to the knowledge of the truth. So what's going on in this passage? We have to interpret this Scripture in light of all the other Scripture, including Scripture that we've already read in Hebrews. The challenge here is, is there are other places that suggest those whom God truly saves, God will never let go. So what's going on? Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed once for all from death to life. The Apostle John says, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out. So it was shown that they are not all of us. In other words, they were here for a while. But because they left the church and didn't come back and they refused the faith, it's proven that they they never were genuine to start with. Hebrews 7.25 says, God is able to save forever those who draw near to Him through Christ. Our church's statement of faith summarizes the biblical witness on this very subject, in this way, all true believers endure to the end. Those whom God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by His Spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but will persevere to the end. So what's going on? Did they receive the knowledge of the truth? Or did they not receive the knowledge of the truth? And the answer is that time will tell. That is the point and the nature of of a warning. He's not saying there is or could be an actual case of genuine belief followed by genuine loss of salvation, but he's saying that they genuinely said they were part of the family. They really said they had come to the knowledge of the truth. They really said they were sanctified by the blood of Jesus. They knew the right language of the gospel. They looked like a believer. But if they walk away, They never were. Whether that is true or not, whether they were really genuine or not, is going to be revealed in time by what they do with this warning. Whether they endure or fade away as the race intensifies down the stretch. Back in the day, I was a cross-country runner, and there was a time when I was in shape, and um, I really enjoyed running. That, That time has long passed. Actually, I still enjoy running. I just can't go nearly as far until the joints remind me that I'm not 18. But you always could identify the eager beavers who would show up and they hadn't really practiced well because many of them would take off on a dead sprint. Now, the really good ones can do that. But for the most part, the average bear, high school, or running a cross-country race, and when they take off in a sprint, you can't get roped into their game because at about a mile in, they're going to be fading fast. And I'm afraid that that happens sometimes in the Christian life. We, we come to a rally or a conference, we, we hear a good message and we walk an aisle, we pray a prayer, we check a box, we sign a card, we get, we get dunked when 35 other people are getting dunked and our friend gets saved. And, and I've seen this time and again in the Christian life that people are not responding to Jesus, they're responding to a feeling or a moment or an emotion. And it looks like they hit the they they it looks like they're shooting out a, on the racetrack like man they are just going for Jesus but really they're just going on adrenaline or an emotional high and then they fade and they never come back. They don't finish the race. 
What does God say about such people? He says in Hebrews, they never had genuine conversion. God uses both promises and warnings to help those who are saved to endure to the end. Genuine believers will hear this warning and they will heed it. They will keep coming back to Jesus. While it's not possible to lose genuine salvation, church, it is possible to be self-deceived. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.8, Let no man deceive himself. In the parable of the soils, when the sower spreads the seed, seed falls beside the road and it springs up very quickly, but it had no root. And as soon as the sun came out, what happened? It was consumed. They looked genuine for a moment, and then they perished. Those who heed this warning and endure will bear the fruit of Christ, and they are genuine. But those who do not heed the warning may seem to start well, but they are ultimately proven to be fakers and imposters and church disruptors. Those who are, do you see it in verse 27? Those who are God's adversaries. They may have professed faith. They may have been walking so it seemed with Jesus. But ultimately, it is proven that they never were. They are enemies of the cross of Christ and the message of the Gospel. As one commentator says, hell is full of people who have a clear understanding of the Gospel, but they never really bowed their knee to Jesus Christ as King. And hell is what is on the way for those who reject Jesus. Leaving Jesus may seem convenient right now, but it is costly for forever. Do you see that in verse 27? What should they expect? Those who don't heed the warning, what do they have to expect? The terrifying, the fearful expectation of judgment. Why? Because they will face the full and fiery fury of God's wrath, which will consume them. Do you see that word consume in verse 27? It's in the present tense. This doesn't mean they'll be consumed and then extinguished and so... They'll just die and they'll, they'll disappear from existence. Rather, the word is in the present tense, meaning the fire of hell will consume and consume and consume. It's literally the word to eat. It will keep on eating them. Heed the warning. Make sure you're in Christ. Revelation 14.11 says it this way, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. A Puritan pastor by the name of Thomas Watson was trying to summarize what it would be like to have an eternity separated from the love of God. He says, Oh, eternity, if all the body of earth and sea were turned to sand and all the air up to the starry heaven were nothing but sand and a little bird should come every thousand years and fetch away in her bill but the tenth part of grain of all that heap of sand. What numberless years would be spent before the vast heap of sand would be fetched away. Yet, if at the end of all that time the sinner might come out of hell, there would be some hope. But that word ever breaks the heart. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Church, Hebrews is clear. Remaining faithful to Jesus, putting all of our hope in Him, it is not a game. It is life or death, and it is forever. If you don't know Christ today, if you're playing mental games with Jesus, if you're not surrendered to Him, let today be the day that the games are up and real life begins. Trade the fearful expectation of judgment for life abundant in Christ the Son. But perhaps this morning you hear of God's judgment and you go, God is love, God wouldn't judge. Hebrews tackles that argument next in verses 28-31 through 31, and it reminds us that God is just and God is right to judge those who refuse His Son. Verse 28 he reminds us again of the Old Testament. He's saying, you know the Old Testament called for serious punishment of those who set aside the law of Moses, which meant the, the flagrant and outright rebellion against God. He quotes from Deuteronomy 17.6, which says, on the evidence of two witnesses, or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put 
to death. And then he reminds us there's no mercy at the end of that. If you set aside the law of Moses and flagrantly rebel against God, it's not like they're like, well, we're going to give you a second chance. No, they, they stone you to death. That's it. And that's what he means when there's no mercy at the end of that. And here's the progression of his argument from verse 28 to 29. If that's what they did in the Old Testament, which was predicting the arrival of Jesus, the sacrifice to cover sins in the New Testament, and if you throw away Jesus, how much more punishment do you think you deserve? How much more severe should it be? In verse 29, he demonstrates that God's everlasting punishment of those who reject His Son, that it is deserved. If someone abandons Jesus when the test of adversity comes, when she realizes that Jesus isn't popular with her friends, or as she moves along the rungs of the corporate ladder and trusting in Jesus is politically inconvenient at the office, she's rejecting her need for Jesus and ultimately Jesus Himself. The author is telling us in these verses, he's urging us, do not underestimate your need for Christ in your place. You see, when we, when we deny that God would send someone into His wrath for rejecting His Son, we are misunderstanding two truths. One, just how bad our sin is. And two, just how holy God is. He is infinitely holy. He is totally worthy. He is Creator God. We are contingent upon Him. And if you set aside the Gospel, if you stop believing in Jesus, you are setting aside Jesus Himself. You can't have life in Jesus and deny why Jesus came. Look at verse 29. There's three things that the author says that we do when we reject Christ. When we reject Christ, we trample underfoot the Son of of God. When we reject Christ, we regard as unclean the blood of the covenant. And finally, we insult the Spirit of grace. These three things hang together as a unit. If you do number one, you automatically do two and three. If you do two, you automatically do one and three. If you do three, you do one and two. Everybody tracking? It's like a multiple choice exam. If you do A, then you better check D because you've done all of them. The first thing that happens when we reject the Son, uh, the first thing that happens when we reject the Gospel and renounce our need for Christ is we are trampling over the Son of God. Just, just think about that language. Something that you would trample over. Something that you would deem worthless. To leave behind our need for the grace of God through Jesus is not just rejecting the message of the Gospel, it's mocking the Son of God. Treating Him like a little bug that's in your path, that's in your way. You just squash Him. Treating Jesus like an inconsequential nuisance, interrupting my plans and my dreams for my life. Notice, Jesus is called the Son of God, verse 29. The options in chapter 10 are clear. You can draw near to the Father through His Son and know life and joy and purpose through Him, or you can throw away His Son and pay the consequences. Hebrews makes a big deal about Jesus being the Son. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 we read in these last days, God has spoken to us in His Son. He is God's final word. Be saved in Christ or don't be saved. To which of the angels did He ever say, You are My Son? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Don't let go of the Son who gives you access to the Father. How does He give you access to the Father? Do you remember what Jesus says? He who has seen Me has seen the Father. I am in the Father and the Father is in Me. John 14, 9 and 10. It is impossible to know God as your Father if you go on diminishing your need for His Son. Don't throw away the life that is available in Jesus and in Jesus alone. Second, it's not just that you trample the Son of God underfoot. The second thing that you do is you regard as unclean the blood of the covenant. This, is, this means the new covenant. The covenant by which we can be clean on the inside, not just on the outside. And rather than regard Jesus' blood as holy and as pure and as that which cleanses, those who reject Jesus have it backwards. They look at the cross of Christ and they're like, 
Oh, that's gross to me. Why, why did Jesus have to die? Couldn't he just come and be a good teacher? Couldn't he come and just be a nice prophet? Couldn't he be like any of the other religious teachers out there and give me some good things, you know, preach the Sermon on the Mount, challenge me a little bit? But did he really have to die in my place? That's gross. He had to die in your place. Your sin was that wicked. It was that vile. It separated you that much from a holy God. And those who, who look at the cross and they see it as something that's repulsive, they don't understand Good Friday. They don't understand the miracle that God poured out His wrath on His Son so that He would not have to pour it out on you. And when they disregard the blood of Jesus, they treat it as unholy or as a common thing. They are sorely and eternally mistaken. It's like they find a bloody band-aid over in the gymnasium at an upward ball game and they're like, ooh, that's gross, and they just toss him away in the trash can. But the blood of Jesus is pure. It is holy. He's the only human who's ever come. Yes, He's fully God, but He was fully man and is fully man. And He came to die and to take your place. He came to live the life you didn't live but should have. And He came to die the death you deserve to die but don't have to if you trust in Him. Hebrews has told us that it is His blood that secures eternal redemption. Chapter 9, verse 12. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses the conscience. Chapter 9, verse 14. It's the blood of Jesus that removes sin. Chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. It's the blood of Jesus that gives access into the presence of God. Chapter 10, verse 19. It's the blood of Jesus that takes the unclean and makes them clean. Don't throw away the cleansing power of the bloody sacrificial death of the Son of God in your place. Because if you do, the last thing you've done is you have insulted the Spirit of grace. This is another way of saying you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. You've insulted the Spirit. The Spirit of grace is calling you into salvation through Christ. He's calling you into life abundant in God. He wants to change your heart from the inside out. He wants you to surrender to God and receive the gift of life. But if you go on stubbornly refusing your need for Jesus, then you're mocking the Holy Spirit. You're denying your need for grace. In verse 30, the author of Hebrews quotes from the song of Moses found in Deuteronomy 32. The song tells of God's grace to Israel and Israel's rebellion to God. In verses 35 and 36 of that chapter, God promises that He will judge, that His enemies will receive His just vengeance as payment for their rebellion against God. Then in verse 31 of this chapter, the author describes how useless it will be for those who are trapped in God's judgment to try and escape. The, the hands of the living God refer to His power. He's the God of infinite power. He's omnipotent God. He's Creator God. To fall into the hands of the living God is to be caught in a trap with no hope of escape. At the Palmer household, when my kids were a bit younger, I still do it with Samuel some, I would just trap them in my arms. I just wrap them up, and we have a little contest to see if they could get out of Daddy, Daddy's vice grip. And uh, my daughter now can. She's, she's a bruiser. She, uh, she, I taught her how to box out, and that was not a wise decision. She knows how to lay it on me on the basketball court. But my son, you know, he's still a little guy. And he, I preached this sermon last night. We went home, and he was like, Dad, let's do it. Trap me. Eventually, my, my children are going to be able to get out of my grip. Because I'm getting older, and they're getting stronger day by day. But if you fall into the hands of the living God, the God of all life, the God who is the author of life, the God who will never, ever die, you will be caught in a trap from which you cannot escape. God says of the idolaters in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 39, there is no one who can deliver from my hand. As it is, verse 31 describes this falling into God's hands as a terrifying thing. I can think of nothing more fearful than falling into the hands of the living God. As one who has rejected His one and only Son. You say, well, I thought Jesus, I thought God loved everybody. He, he loves His Son. 
The Father loves His Son. And what you do with His Son will be what God does with you. Church, there's a day that's coming when time runs out. When there will be no way of escaping God's wrath. But this warning is given for our good. God has warned us while it is still today because there's still time to repent. If you hear this warning and know that you're in your sins, that that if God would return right now, if Christ would return right now, that if you would leave this building and die right now, if you know that you have not truly repented of your sin and your self-worship and trusted in Christ alone for salvation, then let today be the day. Don't fall into the hands of a living God. Instead, run into the arms of a loving Savior who sent His Son to die for you. The point of this text is not stay dead in your trespasses and sins. It's turn to Jesus Christ who stretched out His hands and had them pierced on Calvary's cross so that you could have life abundant in Him. Run into the saving hands of Jesus. It is eternally better to be in God's hands now than to fall into them on the day of judgment. Don't fall into God's hands. Instead, run into His arms. Stop living on your terms and live for the glory of Christ. When Jesus allowed those Roman soldiers to nail His hands to the cross, Jesus set aside His right to save Himself so that He could be raised to life and save you. Make no mistake about it. The judgment that awaits those who reject Christ is terrifying. But the life that belongs to those who run to Christ now is eternally satisfying. So what should we do? I can think of three responses. First, maybe you're wavering in your faith. Maybe you're on the fence. Maybe maybe you're questioning and doubting. In this sermon, the Spirit of God has used it to awaken you to the reality that Jesus is life. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life for His glory. Praise God. There's others of you, you say, I I know Christ, I I believe this message, I I praise God that I am safe in the arms of the Father through the blood of His Son. And if that's true for you, then let me say to you and to myself, let's get busy. Charles Stanley said this, God's plan for enlarging His kingdom is so simple. One person telling another person about the Savior. But we're busy. And we're full of excuses. Remember, someone's eternity is at stake. The joy that you will have when you meet that person in heaven will far exceed any discomfort you feel when you share the Gospel. And finally, whether you're out there on live stream or right here in this room, if you've been playing games with Jesus, or maybe you're just now tuning in, hearing of Jesus for the first time, God sent His one and only Son to give you life and life everlasting. He knows that you are a sinner. He knows that you've done and said things that displease God. That you've thought things that displease God. And that these things separate us from the love of the Father. So He sent His Son who didn't do anything that displeased the Father. And He died to pay the price of your sin and be raised on the third day so that you could be raised up to a whole new way of living right now. And when Jesus returns, so that you could live forever with Him. If you don't know Christ, let today be the day that you turn from your sin and your shame and your self-worship and trust in the saving power of Jesus. Because this is what Jesus says, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. Those who trust in Jesus, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Do you know Him? Do you know him? Would you pray with me? God in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge that you bring to us by way of the book of Hebrews. God, I pray for those who know you this morning that this warning would be exhortation to finish strong. God, that we wouldn't start out of the gate early and quick and fall short of the finish line. 
God, for those who don't know you this morning, let today be the day of salvation. God, whether it's over live stream or seated right here in this sanctuary, Spirit of God, we ask that you would do your work and that no one would insult the Spirit of grace as we stand and sing. Amen. Let's stand together.
Well, amen, and thank you, church, for your uh, attentiveness this morning and for joining here in the sanctuary and by live stream. I see a few guests this morning. I want to ask if you might do us a favor. There's a card in your pew rack that says welcome on it. If you would kindly fill that out, there's a box at this door and as this door as you leave and drop that in. I'd love to have a chance to find out what God is up to in your life and to pray for you. So if that's something you feel comfortable doing, I'd love to have a chance to welcome you personally. Um, and thank you for being here. For those of you online, you can do the same thing. You can find our virtual work, welcome card on our website, nrbc.org. And there's a big tile on the front that says welcome. If you'll click that, you can fill that out virtually as well. So thank you all for being here. I want to pray for you as we dismiss. God in heaven, thank you uh, for your grace to us in Christ. Spirit of God, Thank you for being a spirit of grace, of reminding us of the great sacrifice of Jesus and its complete and total sufficiency to rescue us and to cleanse us so that we could be the children of God. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the gospel. We'll never get over it. We'll sing of it for eternity. And we thank you that this day we've been able to gather and sing and hear of it together. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we dismiss, uh, we'll do so in a bit of an orderly fashion. I'm just going to ask if the latter half of the sanctuary, if you would dismiss out both of these doors, this door over to my left.